All right, I think it's 9.02. Um, we can slowly start with introductions. So thank you everybody for joining and everybody who's already here to our third Stanford Medical Mixed Reality panel, uh, this time on haptics and discussing how haptics um, can augment these medical mixed reality experiences. The panel will be led by Joel. Joel was a mechanical engineering student at Stanford. Then he had uh, several startups. So one way he was bringing prosthetics to the developing world. So they developed some really affordable 3D printed prosthetics. He had the um, startup Piper for, where they developed STEM kits for kids and is currently working on lots of different haptics technology. So Joel, if I can please um, give the word to you. Oh, hey, hey everyone. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, <laughs> thanks for the, to have me here, Christoph. I guess a, a little bit of my background, like you mentioned, I, uh, you know, I come originally from a medical device, you know, hammers and nails and biomechanics and physical devices, uh, working with orthotics, wheelchairs and prosthetics. I could show a couple images so you guys get some uh, uh, context of where I'm coming from and why I think haptics is one of the most exciting areas, especially when applied to, to healthcare. Um, uh, so, you know, I studied at MIT and Stanford uh, trying to design for the human body, which is, I think, haptics is one of the most beautiful combinations of, you know, understanding the human body and human needs, uh, perception and, uh, uh, and user interface. And so, my early work was coming from trying to design things really affordable for the developing world. Uh, and so the Jaipurni was uh, something I did at Stanford during my master's time that uh, uh, I really sort of appreciated the, the, you know, designing at the human interface and what it takes. Um, and later on, uh, got into this world of uh, virtual world. I was an avid gamer. Uh, I played a lot of Minecraft and I figured, well, <laughs> You know what are we going to do to inspire uh you know the, the future into stem education and so P piper you could go to playpiper.com was a uh, stem kit that i worked on for my uh auto actually out of my phd uh when i came back through different startups and so this was all about using your hands and then using a virtual world not headsets in this case but minecraft like you see here to simulate what's going on and it turned out to be a really beautiful way to get people to sort of understand quickly what's going on with a complex system and our thing is if a 10 year old can build a computer then anyone can uh, uh, and so i think what's exciting about these panelists is the use of simulation and what they're doing to in a low cost way and quick way co communicate complex things so i learned early on that you could get 10 year olds to, to you could get anyone to do something as complex as building a computer like you see a few seconds of this here um, no headsets, but using 3D, uh, and uh, you know now I'm I'm focusing on what I think is a very exciting world of XR. So the combination of virtual reality, augmented reality, to kind of uh, recreate the even more complex scenarios like here you see pulling apart some anatomy, and the the team in the anatomy department at Stanford has done some awesome work during the pandemic, replacing cadaver labs with. Um, digital uh, models in VR and in non-VR, just like you see here. Instead of taking apart a computer, why not take apart the human body? Um, and so the real key question that we're excited to dive into with the panel is, you know, where does the sense of touch come into this world? Um, so really excited to be here. And uh, 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 let's jump into some more introductions of who we have in the room. Uh, so I'm going to uh, introduce our first panelist, uh, so Professor Alison Okamura of the uh, Charm Lab uh, at Stanford. Uh, Alison, maybe tell us a little bit. I think each each person's got a little blurb on uh, and some images of what they work on. Hey, give us a flavor of uh, what you're up to. Absolutely. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Can everybody hear me okay? Great, and hopefully see my slides as well. Yes, yeah, so I'm a faculty in the Department of Mechanical Engineering with a courtesy appointment. My background in this, this field of haptics and virtual reality, um, you know, some in the 90s, but um, I think what really connected 
time at Immersion, which was a startup company at the time. Oh, listen, just one suggestion, uh, because you're very often cut off, do you perhaps want to turn off your video? That might save oh. a bit of bandwidth. So not your screen, but not your screen share, but you're just your video, yeah. perhaps to save a little how, bit of bandwidth. How about this? I'm on That's, campus, yeah. so it should be oh. good, <laughs> but let's try Let's try this. Thank you. Um, thanks. Yeah, so I, I worked at a part-time in a startup company while I was a PhD student, which really um, uh, actually got, got me into connecting haptic devices to virtual reality for medical simulation, uh, and then spent 10 years as a faculty member at Johns Hopkins University, where I was very close Stanford for 10 years as a faculty member. So my here who contributed to some of the work I'll, I'll briefly talk about the students with backgrounds in computer science, mechanical engineering, bioengineering, and, and all that we do in haptics. And I'll give you a little sampling of that now. So overall, I'm interested in how haptics can enable physical connections between people, whether it's um, a human to another human, a human to a virtual or augmented reality environment, uh, a human and an agent, uh, for example, something that gives you driving directions, um, as, well, as well as humans in the robot environment. Um, I'm going to focus Um, in the context of, of, of this introduction, because I think this is. Uh, unfortunately, so unfortunately would... right now, sorry, the, the, the connection is very bad. Is there um, any chance you can connect to a uh, younger yeah, no, We can't connect to LTE or anything, right? Stanford Internet seems to be um, unreliable right now. Alison, are you still here? Is everybody able to hear me now? Maybe would it be a I can I can try again. And if it's still bad, maybe we would have someone else introduce themselves while we see if it gets better. Um, I saw a thumbs up though, so I'm gonna hope that it is better now. Okay. Um, yeah, so I one of the things that we're really interested in is what is the form of tactile feedback or haptic feedback that's appropriate in medical simulation. So what example is something that combines kinesthetic or force feedback with tactile feedback? Uh, and, and these are things like active surfaces, which have been used to sort of display lumps and bumps in medical simulators. We've also looked at more forms of haptic feedback that provide guidance um, and, and moving away from grounded stationary haptic devices towards ones that are, are holdable or wearable even, and uh, trying to use lower cost techniques as, as Joel alluded to. Uh, so vibration feedback is in all of our, our cell phones, many mobile devices, and even in our watches. Uh, but can we use vibrations as a way to provide uh, more rich information? And one example is asymmetric vibrations, which can help guide people in terms of uh, the, their direction of movement. So these sort of uh, uh, haptic augmentation techniques aren't necessarily just for displaying realism, but can also be used for guidance. Uh, in addition, in trying to, to move away from large, uh, bulky, world-grounded devices to devices that are more mobile, we've been looking at how do you stimulate the skin on the fingertip in order to provide uh, a, a fairly realistic sense of interaction with an environment as shown here. And then even moving beyond the fingertip, we're interested in how do we stimulate other parts of the body and understand when that's useful. So for example, uh, we're interested in distributed tactile displays that you can wear on the arm, which in the cases of um, augmented or other forms of reality, uh, you may wanna leave the hands and fingers free and starting to explore what we can do on other parts of the body uh, that might be realistic. And finally, exploring some of the more social emotional aspects of, of touch, which uh, are maybe not as applicable, for example, to mixed reality in, in surgery, but in other areas of, of medicine, such as rehabilitation and uh, psychology, 
we look at how the role of touch interactions between people and the devices that can display those touch interactions, which are pre-recorded, how, how those actually can affect someone's uh, emotional state and interpretation. So with these uh, various areas, um, I'm really pleased to in introduce our, our work to you and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And also that it, the second half works perfectly. Yeah. Okay, Thanks. great. <laughs> awesome. Uh, that was great. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Allison. And so next we have uh, Dr. Danny Gohl from Precision, CEO of Precision OS, uh, that's working on some really exciting uh, works at the forefront of simulation and uh, for medical simulation. Danny, maybe give us a little flavor of uh, what you're working on. And Yeah, thank you, Joel. Uh, thank you for organizing this event. And it's a pleasure to be here and meet everybody. And uh, I'm going to share uh, my screen here as well and give you some background on myself and then a little bit about our team and then what we've been up to for the last several years. So uh, for background, I'm an orthopedic surgeon in Vancouver, so just north of you all. And uh, I've uh, been a surgeon for about just over a decade now. And my interest in all this became apparent when when I started practice and that the trainees uh, that want to become surgeons always want to get their hands uh, into our, our patients and practice their procedures. And for me, that was just not an ideal way to learn. And I think there's other options that should be available for people that are trained to be surgeons to make them much more proficient. And so I got together with some game developers uh, back four years ago, and we started exploring this idea of VR, which I had never seen before. And uh, hence, this was born. And really, my knowledge in all this is continuing to evolve and transform. And to give you an example of how I think we can change, uh, and this topic is quite, uh, quite ideal for that, is when I switched to an iPhone uh, from a BlackBerry, some of you may not remember what a BlackBerry was, I actually returned the iPhone because I wasn't keen on the absence of haptics in the iPhone at the time. And I wanted the tactile feel of BlackBerry. And I returned the iPhone. And the woman that I returned the iPhone to said, you're the first person to ever return an iPhone. And I said, I'm surprised by that because the tactile piece. So this is, it speaks to how over time I've evolved because I've purchased an iPhone again on this idea of haptics and learning. So one of the challenges that we're dealing with is that as medicine evolves, uh, some of the training has not. And this is a Rembrandt from 1632, which some of you may have seen. This is where how and how they would teach people about anatomy and uh, tactile and surgical procedures, even going back about 400 years ago. And really nothing has changed. I'm actually at a spine meeting here in Boston today. And this is the courses that are going on right now where people are learning this similar model. So one of the things that we want to do is provide an opportunity for people to have access that's, you know, cadavers aren't available all over the world and they're becoming much more scarce as a resource. Uh, we know that this type of training is expensive and it's certainly not widely available. So how do we change that paradigm while also thinking differently? So if I was to look at, you know, the most resource rich part of the world, uh, this is the number of surgeons that graduate that are unable to operate independently every year. And so for me to think about how we have the best resources here in North America to have that number as of surgeons who have spent the last 15 years in school being unable to graduate is quite a disappointment. And then of course there's an asymmetry because it doesn't matter where you go in the world, patients always feel that the surgeon has their best interest in mind and has a skill set to deliver on what they're gonna do. And the only weapon they have against the incompetent surgeon is hemorrhage, which I thought was a very uh, poignant quote by Professor Halstead. So, and of course he always graduated only 15% of all uh, graduates, uh, un unlike the C1, do one, teach one, which suggests that everybody graduated. So what we, I'm just gonna advance to the next slide. So what we've put together is this idea of how do we create a model that's accessible uh, globally, uh, that's certainly available and actually changes how we actually practice uh, how to become a surgeon that introduces idea of haptics at the same time. And I'll talk a little bit about that on the discussion. But really what we are trying to do is reimagine balancing a knowledge focused industry with a more objective assessment and then introducing this idea of touch, uh, which is important in orthopedics. I'm gonna show you an overview of some of the content we've built over the years, um, just to give you an overview and I'll turn the volume down so it's not too loud. But one of the things that we introduce in the simulation environment is this idea of whole task training, where you actually get to experience the entire patient experience not just do part of the procedure, which is also very important. Here we introduce this idea that everything you do in the operating room is a decision. I'll just turn the volume down a little bit more just in case it's 
overriding me. But we introduced this concept of, you know, perceptual expertise, knowing what to do, when to do it, collecting all your data as you make decisions in the virtual space and delivering it back to you while introducing haptics where it makes sense and where it's relevant. And we'll talk a little bit about that other discussion. Um, so here's something in the arthroscopic space that we've done where you can actually feel every time you hit a camera on the bone or the burr is resecting bone, you actually feel vibration in the controllers, which you're all familiar with in the virtual reality environment. Drilling is a very unique thing or sawing in orthopedics because it's always associated with sound. So when you combine sound with touch, the question that we're asking is, how much haptics do you truly need to actually deliver value from a skill acquisition trans, uh, skill acquisition perspective? And I'll show you one paper that we have published uh, in JAMA, which suggests that uh, it may not be as much as we think, but further research certainly is indicated in that area. Now, this idea of access is really important to us as an organization because this is me teaching people how to do a knee replacement, and these are four other trainees that are in different parts of the world and they have VR and many of you have seen this remote collaboration idea, but it's quite powerful because now we can conduct learners to mentors anywhere in the world. And I just wanna share this one paper of taking senior residents, randomizing them to virtual reality and then watching a video, which we do commonly about the same surgical procedure. And what we found was quite interesting when we had them test on a cadaver uh, on a pathologic cadaver, so the specimen was made abnormal to simulate the clinical scenario. The surgery time was equal in both, and these were assessed by independent uh, entity. The steps completed were identical, but the correct orientation of the augment or the way the procedure should have been done was correctly done in the VR group, and then only 22% in the non-VR group. If you look at the correct size, the defect that was supposed to be recreated in this uh, specimen, it was done correctly in the VR group and 0% in the video group, and then here's shown, if you decide where to put the wire in this particular model, done correctly in the VR and incorrectly in the non-VR group. And then overall, if you look at these steps that were done incorrect in the video group, these would have resulted in catastrophic failure in the, uh, in the patient in real life. And these were all statistically significant. Now, I won't get into this, but my last two slides are just showing that part of simulation is to determine its valid validity. And we've been working hard to scientifically prove the validation of what we're doing. And these are sort of key benchmarks that you have to establish to validate a simulation. And so we're working hard to do that. And of course, this last slide I wanted to share is, you know, we've built the first uh, VR module for a humanitarian organization that's based out of Richland, Washington. And what they do now is they travel to Africa to train people on how to do procedures to these surgeons so they can treat their patients who are usually the working class. So the economic impact of that training is quite profound because they early, only currently make $2 a day and if they go into poverty because they can't work, the entire family goes into poverty and has a generational impact. So when we think of this, we think big, uh, we think access and we think global. And I wanna thank you for that. It's awesome, Danny. And I, uh, <laughs> I'll just comment that when I see this work, one gets the feeling that the future is here and uh, what's a beautiful sort of demonstration of um, you know, impacting today with the technology we have, and also this, uh, you know, fusion of accessibility with, with current technology. Um, we, we also, uh, I, I really appreciate that, that mixture. Um, and so, uh, and, and you could really see having me having actually gone through a glenoid exposure and they, uh, and used a, done a hip replacement about 20 times and got a pretty low score. I think uh, very interesting that fusion of not just visualizing, interacting, and getting a score. Uh, uh, you know, I think we're all seeing a little a little glimpse of how perhaps everyone's going to be training here. So excited to have you here, Danny. Um, Thank you. Uh, awesome work. Uh, also, from the the side of practical things that are out there now in the real world, it's great to see. You know, Allison sort of seen every experimental thing at the forefront of of haptics, and so. You know, with Danny, this is things that are impacting surgeons today. Uh, and and next up, we have Craig Douglas, CEO of Contact CI, who from the the device side is focusing entirely on uh, the actual one actual mechanism of providing uh, haptics. Uh, Craig, uh, maybe you could uh, jump in and give us a little flavor of what you're up to with Contact CI and and your approach to to uh, to haptics. It's got a very special point of view on uh, on how to deliver force. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for being here. I appreciate everyone's time and, and joining on the panel on haptics to learn from all of us. It's it's great to you know get to hear from you know Allison and Danny and, and Joel and the rest of the panel as a group. So thank you for you know including me here. Um, my background as the, the co-founder of Contact CI, um, we started working on haptics in the what you know the, I call the Oculus Awakening period of VR based on the fact that for spatial computing or telerobotics to really get where it needed to be in the, the long term we saw that there had to be a, a mass product that brought the audio and the visual to the same level um, and the haptics to the same level as the audio and visual. So we started kind of looking at how can we do as much multi-force while being as ergonomically designed as possible um, based on the fact that a uh, you know, a lot of times we we feel like anything that's trying to be in the consumer's hand, you know, uh, doesn't necessarily take as much of the ergonomics into effect. But you know, how, what is the uh, highest level of simulation that could be output as a force? What we wanted to be was the most level of blend force we could kind of do from uh, multiple actuations without impeding the individual user on what they intend to do. Um, so I'll show you a, a current prototype of, of our glove right now um, is this one right here. So we, we're shipping this out to, to users that are mostly working in the simulation training space. A few um, here locally with us in our, in our headquarters in Cincinnati on the, the medical side, being like Cincinnati Children's Hospital, um, working on a, a few different pilot projects with them right now. Um, but mostly the, the device is um, an exotendant based system. So you're probably all familiar with exoskeletons, but using a similar force vector, but designed around you know, how your tendons run to your finger cap to, to be able to bring you back from there. Um, as well as you know, embedding the vibro tactile on the fingertip. So using those two to kind of blend right on uh, specifically just the fingertip right now from the, the wearable device. Uh, so I have a, a little video that I want to share to to show some of the other interactions that are that are possible inside of VR using it right now. So let me share the screen. I already see from this video, we definitely have to go back to the in-person meetings at some point so we can try and feel the haptics that you. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, hand, hands-on is very much the, the way that I prefer to share. I'm sure most people do. And, and, and that's one of the things I'm happy to get into in the questions and from that standpoint. Um, but you know, to, to discuss what's happening here a little bit on the screen, sorry, I don't know if you guys have the volumes coming through on your end or not. It probably wasn't. Um, but uh, the glove is, you know, having the each individual tendon give you a, a force feedback actuation as you're having the collision happen inside the game engine. Um, so we've built from the. Let me stop this. Um, so at Contact CI, we've you know built these gloves based off of the the mission of wanting to extend their hands along with the eyes in in the headsets from the VR AR perspective for the most part, but also you know again how do we make sure that. Um, you know, not getting stuck in what is the, the limitations of the VR, you know, aspect today of, of being just the gameplay intuitive, but what is intuitive to everyone as a whole? How can we be a high fidelity simulated sense? Um, and one of the ways that we design that is by um, leaning into what is the leading gesture tracking solutions that are out there as well. So not trying to um, replace, you know, what each system wants to, whether it's um, putting a leap motion in front of a 2D screen or like a looking glass or being, you know, all the way to the end of being in your augmented reality system like a, a HoloLens or in your VR headset. Um, we want to use what is the tracking system that's going to be bringing your hands in from that device uh, and then allow the, the haptics to be able to then be interplayed as the, the third immersion uh, force for you. Um, so then again, this is kind of just some of the overall principles of what we've put into the glove today. Um, is the, the exotendant and the, the vibro tactile being the first two forces that we're, we're trying to add in. Um, but again, you know, the, the whole product system is the, the full stack of what makes that possible inside of the, the VR simulation from a, an API integration standpoint, all the way down to the kind of the haptic engines uh, integration as well. So uh, that's kind of the, the introduction, everything about us here at Context CI. Um, you know, we're looking at, you know, 
distributing the gloves mostly through training applications, like I said, so I'm happy to talk a bit about the, the use cases we've seen so far today. But the, the long term goal is trying to figure out how we can make sure that you know, hands and fingers are, are brought to the spatial computing world at the same level the eyes and ears are. Excellent. Thanks, Craig. It's an awesome uh, uh, demonstration of, uh, you know, a device out there in the wild. And as Allison used the term, a grounded haptic device versus a wearable, ha this is a wearable haptic device. That's maybe what people think of when they think of a haptic uh, glove. Maybe that's the first thing. Grounded being things that are sort of uh, fixed in the world. It, they're larger devices fixed to your desk or the, or the ground. Um, and so, you know, next up, we, we do have uh, uh, Govinda from uh, Intuitive Surgical, uh, Govinda Payavula, tell me if I pronounced that correct, correct. Uh, right, yeah. uh, has a bit of a larger and more expensive device, also uh, improving people's lives and uh, has a unique approach to using uh, simulation uh, uh, and, and digital. Uh, and, and Govinda, maybe tell us a little bit about your, your background in, uh, in this medical training field. Okay, yeah, thank you, Joel. Uh, thanks, everyone. So I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I hope you all can see my screen. Uh, good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Govind Payaula. I work at uh, uh, Intuitive Surgical as in uh, a managing principal. Uh, I'm currently heading the uh, XR uh, uh, Innovation Center. Um, so uh, here we are exploring like uh, various like an AR, uh, VR, and then like a MR uh, um, a technology, and then the applications, and then uh, uh, building the uh, prototypes, and then like working with the uh, key stakeholders within the company, and then like uh, understanding like okay what the opportunities, and then like how do we uh, 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 bring this one into the customer hands. So that's my uh, uh, group is uh, focusing currently. Uh, so I am at Intuitive Surgical like uh, since uh, 2008, worked on uh, various uh, surgical uh, uh, robotic platforms, building those platforms from like a uh, concept to like productizing. Uh, we built uh, right now we are at like a you know, fourth generation surgical robot. Uh, we also like have like in various uh, uh, simulators so the surgeons can put their uh, uh, head in and then like uh, practice in the simulator like uh, uh, before coming into the into the operating room. So uh, I, I joined like uh, uh, Intuitive Surgical uh, uh, before uh, that, like uh, I was working at J&J Ethicon Center, uh, Ethicon Endosurgery, uh, worked on various like class two and then class three medical devices. Uh, so I'm in this uh, medical industry field for like uh, almost like uh, 20 plus uh, uh, years. Uh, ranging from like class three, class two, and then like uh, 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 the the ecosystem around the medical products. So the, we are in a very exciting phase here, like because like if you see uh, uh, in, in this uh, uh, diagram uh, uh, on the bottom, you can see that like uh, the Devinci XI system, that's the uh, flagship product. The, the surgeon is sitting at the console and then like they're interacting with this uh, 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 master tool manipulators we call MTMs. And then like uh, on the bedside, there is a patient and then like, so you are, uh, 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 you have the patient side card uh, with the instruments installed. As the surgeon moves their hands, the instruments inside the patient body uh, moves. So think of this as like an uh, 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 VR console. So the Intuitive Surgical has figured out that like, okay, how do we bring in like an best in class and like immersive experience so they went and then like built that uh, uh, VR and uh, console. So it's one of the good example for like a VR. Uh, this this product is in the market uh, uh, for almost like uh, 25 years. And then like uh, uh, almost like 8.5 million surgeries have been conducted. And just alone like last year, like 1.2 million surgeries are conducted. So this, this uh, 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 robotic system enables like uh, uh, minimally invasive procedures. So some of the advantages of like uh, this uh, uh, robotic surgery includes uh, uh, less uh, uh, blood loss, uh, reduced uh, pain, and uh, quicker recovery time. So which means like okay, you can uh, 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 get out of the hospital um, much faster and also like less complications because of like uh, all the uh, the benefits that I mentioned. So what it enables to the the surgeon or to the care team is. 
where uh, it, it provides like an uh, immersive 3D uh, HD experience. When you're sitting at the console, when you're looking inside the patient body through the endoscope video, you get the 3D and you have the rested instrument. So you, which means that like, okay, you can do more, uh, more precise and then like accurate tasks. And then like uh, uh, you have like a high dexterity and then uh, you can uh, uh, filter the tremors. So these are some of the uh, benefits of this uh, robotic surgery. Uh, so I, I mentioned that like how we are uh, using the VR and you can see on the bottom of the screen, uh, uh, this is an iris application. So where we are bringing the uh, live 3D segmented models overlaid on the uh, live endoscope video. So this is an, uh, uh, one of the uh, example of like a mixed reality. So you have the live endoscope video and then we are overlaying this uh, segmented model. So that, that's the, that, that's how we see that like uh, 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 we are in this uh, uh, AR and VR for like almost like 25 years. And then uh, as this technology is advancing, there are many, many opportunities that's possible with this technology. Thank you very much uh, everybody for the wonderful introductions. Before we now move to the next half an hour to have a panel discussion and uh, discuss with the different candidates uh, about the uh, use and, and uh, the technological challenge of haptics interfaces. One more thing I want to um, announce right now. So many, some of you might already be familiar with it if you attended one of the previous SMR meetings. After the panel, we will move to Gather the Town, which is an interactive format that allows you to directly meet the panelists, also meet each other, ask questions and discuss um, the panel and what has been discussed there in more detail. So it's basically a link that we will post after the panel discussion in the chat. If you click the link and then just allow Gather the Town to use your camera and your microphone, it should be very straightforward to join. So before everybody leaves afterwards and be aware, the meetup and the questions will be in Gather Town afterwards. All right, Joel. Awesome. And I just want to comment on the, you know, seeing the Da Vinci robot would, would go into, I've, during the pandemic, my favorite thing has been to uh, go back and watch my sci-fi library of uh, things. I think I've watched too much Star Trek that I can want to admit publicly, but, uh, but the envisionment of people thinking about surgery in the future, I think what's beautiful about everyone here is that we, we have everyone represented from the forefront of knowledge and research right of you know uh, haptics and all the way to like actually sort of impacting patients on the operating table so uh you know uh, a fantastic uh i'm honored to be amongst uh you know <laughs> experts at different points in the chain here uh but i do want to jump into a little bit of a discussion on uh on the topic um you know i guess specifically uh you know starting with haptics and why you know what's the big deal why is it important we, we've seen some beautiful visuals here and maybe heard a little bit of audio and seen some use cases in the medical field um and uh you know i might nominate danny in particular to, to from his like you know experience as an orthopedic surgeon well what is the importance of the sense of touch uh in work that you do why do we why do we care about haptics yeah, so it's a, it's a it's a complex question, and I'll certainly I'll start. So touch helps you drive decisions when you're operating, and it helps you drive decisions up to a point where touch no longer becomes uh, important. And an example of that would be someone who's learning to be a surgeon has to have a combination of, and I'll use orthopedics as an example, <clears throat> a combination of touch and sound. But what happens is when the novice starts to break through and become more of an expert. They actually forget about the touch idea and become more attuned with the visual piece and the auditory piece of what we do in orthopedics, specifically the visual piece. And Govind will talk about the visual haptic idea of what it looks like when you deform tissue and how you can tell how much pressure you're putting on that. But I think it's, it's sort of a gradation of skill. So you need it early, at least in orthopedics, and then it sort of fades away over time and becomes less important. But at the end of the day, it drives your decision-making on when you're gonna do certain activities during your procedure. Awesome. So an important component in the in the in the process. Um, you know, we have been using the term haptics. I, I think it might be helpful, maybe Allison, to give us a little bit of your synopsis on uh, when we say haptics. I think different people think of different things. You mentioned the cell phone and vibration. Um, 
we've seen with Craig with Contact CI, a different style of uh, haptic device uh, that's providing forces in a different way. You know, help us understand a little bit the landscape of when we say haptics, what does that mean uh, in its different varieties? And yeah, thanks. I'd be happy to do that. Uh, so the way I see it, the word haptics means anything having to do with the sense of touch. And so when we design haptic technology, we're looking at how do you stimulate various aspects of human touch. And one aspect of that is, is kinesthesia, measuring typically larger scale forces like joint torques, uh, for example, that would you know, actually cause movement of your body. And, and that's kinesthesia. And um, the other is cutaneous or tactile information, which comes in through small sensors, basically mechanoreceptors, which are embedded in the skin. And I'd say in the field of haptics, um, you know, vibration feedback is extremely ubiquitous. It's, it's cheap and, and able to be placed easily in consumer products. Um, and, and it does stimulate one aspect of, of the mechanoreceptors in the skin. But like I mentioned, uh, the amount of information that you can transmit with it is very limited. It tends to be uh, more of an alert. Uh, whereas uh, kinesthetic feedback or other types of tactile feedback that stretch the skin or, or push on, on, on the fingers in the case of kinesthesia, um, which is more like the device that, that Craig talked about, um, you know, these are things that can provide a much more compelling, immersive environment, provide many more degrees of freedom uh, and, and much more realism. And so I think uh, for haptic engineering, the evolution has been to design uh, on one hand, really cheap <laughs> vibration actuators. On the other hand, extremely expensive, you know, thirty thousand dollar desktop haptic devices that can can push with a grounded force from your desk onto your hand. And now, what we're seeing is this is this movement towards towards wearable devices, things that allow people to be less encumbered, um, you know, move in their environment and do the types of of tasks that would really be needed for the types of simulation environments we're talking about today. Awesome, awesome, and I, I just from the eBay archives, I figure I'd show this is uh, the first yes. haptic device I trained on while I was a student called the Novent Falcon, no longer uh, operating, and uh, not a wearable device, so grounded on the table and a, a robotic uh, mm -hmm. uh, actuated device that could render forces, and so that's a little, a little blast from the past there, uh, targeted for gaming at, at the time. Um, and I think it's something you mentioned, Allison, around the ubiquity of vibration and perhaps it being a low cost way to give alerts is a clue as to, you know, why um, it's sort of low cost is one of one factor and why it's sort of pervasive. Um, yes. Gloves less a part of our everyday life. So maybe Craig could uh, tell us a little bit about uh, why he chose the design that way to deliver forces and what sort of different um, Allison mentioned the word kinesthetic. So this is not just vibrotactile. This is actually rendering forces onto your uh, fingers in a unique way. Maybe Craig, you could uh, riff, riff on what it is that you're doing differently versus what you might find in an iPhone. And, and what shows that for your users, yeah. No, certainly I appreciate that. And, uh, and I think Allison did a wonderful job kind of mocking up uh, what is haptics, what, you know, how it is across the whole world. So I really appreciate that definition. I, I thank you for that. Um, but uh, what we chose to look at it was, again, some of the, the aspect of uh, the range has been very, very high end for right, rightfully end, like being able to do very specific tasks on the surgery table and things that need to be, you know, high precision at the level or um, the haptic engine on your iPhone being able to give you better games when you're interacting or like uh, Danny talked about now being able to have your keyboard interact and go forward and that sort or being able to have your Fitbit tell you when you've gotten your all your steps in for the day or have your iPhone tell you when you've gone through your heart rate counter. Um, those things are really great for, the, for what they can provide. But in your single fingertip, you have about 15 data points that's picking up at any moment based on the, the receptors that Allison was talking about. Um, and your brain, it's the been picking that up since the moment you came out of the womb, being that the sense of touch is the first sense that you have fully developed when you are born. So your brain has been kind of learning throughout its entire life to uh, have this high end sense of data that it's filtering through at a very fast process that you're not really 
uh, aware of at all times how much you're bringing in, right? The fingertip itself, if you, you know, blew it up to a um, earth scale device that you're drawing across, you would be able to feel the difference between a, a car and a house with your fingertip drawing across that, you know, if you were the same scale. So that level of like what you can get from just a vibration when you're trying to, you know, come back to a high simulation level right here isn't enough. Um, so that's like where I think of some of the, the loss of gloves in terms of like, if you think about like, say a power glove or even like the generation of that, which even since it didn't have haptics as what most people think about, um, they're, they're usually based on being a uh, tracking device with just some haptics on top of it, usually being that vibro tactile way. We wanted to look at it as a, how can we still use, you know, ubiquitous cost-effective parts, similar to the way that the Oculus model was what technologies have already been invented, but now put it in a way that you're not going to um, either be restricting the user because it's again, limited in mobility or being in a place where you're not providing uh, too little of information to truly trick the brain, if you will, um, that you're having a tangible interaction with something that's not really real. Um, so that was some of the, like the first thought process behind our designs. Um, but the other aspect came, uh, but really has always been you know, having to stay ergonomic because you know, the other aspect of what your brain learns throughout every intuitive interaction throughout your life is you don't have any weight on the back of your palm ever. You know, even if you're wearing a watch, maybe if you're playing goalie or you know, playing a baseball mitt, you do, but that's about it. And so the trying to keep it in the human factors of movement that what you would expect in the intention of going to grab an item, being able to do a switch, pick up a hammer, being able to do useful tasks like maybe catch a football, you know, things like that. Um, we wanted to make sure that all of the intention of the user doesn't get impeded but there's still enough uh, multi-force level happening to, to be able to give you uh, differentiations between objects and different things that are happening in the, the physics sense. Um, so that's, uh, I guess, the overall what we're trying to do with the, the way that we're going after the device. And the glove comes in because it gives us a kind of a more familiar feel to be able to design on, right? The, this glove specifically um, that, I, that I showed you guys, it actually has a, a pilot's glove base that we've built all the haptics on top of um, so that you know, most the, this device has gone mostly to you know, flight simulation uses. So that those guys have the familiarity of sliding into what they're already going to be putting on, having you know the same level of material, what they're going to be expecting when, and um, you know, say you go to do your switch in the cockpit for the first time, but you know, uh, not changing what your overall you know knowledge base of your human factors are expected to be, but you know, now giving you enough data that a virtual thing somewhat feels real to your brain, um, so that your brain can fill in the gaps. Awesome. So, so I'm getting a clearer picture of it's more, haptics more complex than one might think. And uh, we have uh, uh, a more holistic idea of, of uh, you know, not just vibration. And, and so that's a beautiful. So. But I don't mean to knack vibration just from that. You know, I, I, I'm saying there's lots of like, that's what I like things that there's lots of really, really good uses. Right. And I think one that isn't in the medical world, but say PS5 right there, you know, they're not exactly a vibration in the way they're doing the dual shock, but some of the, the you know, things that they move from the, the vibration device into their ecosystem from there, or there's a company like Tarvanas that they're doing, you know, very good you know, detailed stuff on the screen, right? I was able to feel the difference between a zipper and, uh, you know, running, you know, when it was up and down, just going across on their touchpad. Um, so there are things like that, that vibro tactile can do really well if, you, if you're tuning it properly. But when it comes to like your, you know, point of view perception, I feel like it, you know, uh, the kinesthetic aspect like Allison was referencing is, is a much more necessary portion of what your brain expects. Mm, awesome. And then to, to go to the extreme of, uh, you know, what, ha what happens when uh, just on the visual component, for example, I think Govinda, for, from your vantage point with the with intuitive surgical and the devices, as I understand early on, and, and maybe you could correct if this is wrong, um, these devices maybe don't have the level of kinesthetic haptic feedback that, that Craig was just talking about. Um, but I understand there'd be other strategies to give feedback to the surgeons about what they're doing, what their hands are doing, um, and then ultimately for them to, to, to drive the robot to surgery. So maybe help us understand a little bit about how intuitive tackled this approach of, uh, uh, and, and how haptics were handled in this, if, if, if at all beyond them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question, uh, Joy. Uh, so uh, the way we look at this one is that uh, uh, again, like uh, uh, we have various groups and then like various products, and then like so the way uh, a, a couple of uh, uh, teams they approach is that like okay, 
what it means to the uh, to the patient right like so uh, 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 the, the the look at the patient value first and then like the second one is like uh, the, the 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 surgeon value so like uh, uh, what kind of surgeons are we talking about like are they like experts are they in a, a novice and then like so uh, uh, what kind of training they 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 got before right so uh, how much of like a haptics is required for them and then like so uh, is it the haptics is required for all or like is it for uh, uh, only some set of people and then like if so like for how long they need this one because there is a cost factor involved there is an uh, uh, there is a complexity of like getting this kind of technology working all the time reliably and then like uh, effectively so and then like does it need a calibration does it needs like a, so how do you uh, uh, make sure that like it it doesn't affect the workflow so these are all the things that that will uh, affect us that like okay like can we give an haptics to all so yeah, if, if if it is possible, why not, right? So, but at the same time, like there are these challenges, the, uh, the there are some regulatory challenges, there are like uh, uh, sterility challenges. So we need to make sure that like we have an uh, answer for all of this one before we reliably say that okay, yes, I think here is the haptics, and then like if so, do we need this haptics for like uh, throughout the procedure or like only certain uh, portion of the procedure? Like so, it could be like when you're doing the vessel sealing or when you're doing the stapling. So do you need only during that time or like do you need like uh, 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 all of that? Because then if you need to uh, uh, add some sensors or like some uh, 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 introduce this technology, then what it means to the, the reliability of the product. And then like what happens like uh, when this particular thing stops working, like how do the, the surgeons get back into like continue doing the work what they're doing. So this, these are the kind of things like uh, there is an amazing work that's uh, 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 Alison and then like a lot of people have uh, uh, have done. And then like we, we look at that one and then like uh, we try them in the lab. And then like at the same time, we also see that like, okay, like, okay, what it means to bring into the lab, uh, in, into the operating rooms. Yeah, and I'd put out there that the, uh, from what I understand, just the visual, giving a very rich visual sense of what this, what you're doing, uh, you know, has a so-called visual haptic effect. And I think um, Allison uh, knows a lot about, it's done a, a lot of great research and quantifying and understanding, well, how important are these different senses? And uh, and maybe one surprise is that to get this, the sense of touch doesn't always require rendering a force, but with great power comes great responsibility, as you mentioned with regulatory and so on, that the last thing we'd want to do is to, uh, have an error on the operating table. Uh, so, so I do think that's an important point. And maybe I'd just throw out, since we, we sort of have a little smattering of the of different elements now that are on the table, whether it's not just sort of forces, it's also visual, auditory, and so on. Uh, how, how does haptics, and out to the panel, how does haptics sort of line up in the priority of um, medical simulation in general? I think we are understanding it as one component, uh, and I'm I'm sure you, you all have opinions on uh, on the prioritization, but yeah, how do you all see you know where this lies in the in the overall scheme of uh, of getting the task done? And I'm, Can I go ahead and jump in? <laughs> Okay. Uh, yeah, you know, as, uh, as Danny mentioned um, in his introduction, um, many people think that haptics is especially important in the learning process. And for example, we collaborate with a surgeon, Sherry Wren here at Stanford in the VA hospital, and uh, she uses the Da Vinci and was concerned that when people train um, to do surgery, historically they're doing laparoscopic surgery where they naturally feel forces through the manual instruments. Uh, but then if you transition to a robotic system that has um, maybe less haptic feedback, uh, that you know you would be able to use initially that that earlier information that you learned about visual haptic relationships, and and that would translate then to to doing surgery. But perhaps in the future, no one will be doing manual laparoscopic surgery. And uh, you know, she was concerned about how do you build up that that understanding of the the, the interplay between vision and haptics. So we've, we've done some studies showing how, you know, training with and without haptics might translate to interpreting visual information. We're trying to 
directly um, sense using vision uh, and, and machine learning what, what is the haptic information that you might get from just looking at vision. Um, and so I think that the answer is, you know, vision ultimately is going to be more important, I think, than haptics if you're really looking for, for a ranking. Um, but, but the vision can be more useful, I believe, if there's either a haptic training leading up to it or, or they're, they're tied together. And I'd be really curious to see what Govinda has to say about this as well. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with uh, uh, your comments, Alison. I think, uh, 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 as you all know, like, so uh, we, we have like an, a DaVinci simulator, like, so the surgeons, like, uh, they, they get trained on the simulator. So that's the perfect place for us to introduce, like, uh, the haptics and then, like, see, like, uh, uh, people who are coming from this uh, uh, laparoscopic surgery and then, like, so uh, 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 if they get trained in this uh, simulators, which has an haptics, do we do they really need this uh, haptics while they're performing the surgery if so like okay how long they need i think there are there are these are the kind of questions that uh, uh, we have to understand because as i said like okay like if you have the haptics if you can deliver the haptics in an uh, uh, in an uh, 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 consistent way yes but it has like all these implications so if so then like how do you uh, uh, train these surgeons who are coming from the lab or like from the open world how do you train them with the simulator, which has, uh, uh, we can enable the haptics there, right? So then like, if so, like how, uh, how, how long they need this uh, haptics, even in this uh, uh, training period. I mean, I, I, I guess jumping in as well, um, one way I would add in terms of the uh, look at, not necessarily in the training aspect, but matching up how Allison was saying, of if you already have familiarity with one task in the, the physical, tangible world, um, and you know, repeating that in a virtual world for some sort of need. Um, one of the current projects that we're doing with the Cincinnati Children's Hospital is they had a, a, a couple procedures where on uh, the, the actual device, they don't you know, have it for the specific pediatrics that they need each year. So they have to customize each individual one based on the cases being very different. Um, there's about 10 of these that they do just specifically at the Cincinnati Hospital. And the individual surgeon was spending about 15 hours each case with uh, an, a CAD engineer designing the, the modifications to the 3D device um, to be able to do it based on uploads. When they went over to a, a virtual simulation, um, they were able to cut off you know, about a third of the time using it from a VR standpoint. But when we introduced the gloves and now making it so, okay, we weren't just looking from a VR standpoint and modifying the devices, but the same way that the surgeon would be manipulating the device when they're on the uh, operation floor, um, being able to modify from that standpoint and looking at it, they were able to cut it down by more than a third again and now being under five hours time of prep that they're doing for each one of these cases versus the 15 hours that they were doing for each one before using you know, a 2D way that they were trying to not have the sense of touch in, in the preparation and the learning they're specifically doing for these cases. Um, I think that's just one area that I want to say of where haptics can also augment ways that we're giving patient care of, of being able to speed up, you know, the, the access and the time and the use by uh, making some of the, you know, kind of preparations and things be tangible the way that they would be on the operation floor, um, if that's how the operation is already happening. Awesome. So, so I'm, uh, <laughs> well, uh, you might say we have a biased panel that's very pro. -haptic. Absolutely. Uh, Fair. But, uh, I will not know, deny that. I'm convinced. Uh, I, so you've all made a great case for the importance of the haptics in this overall, uh, you know, space, uh, which is really what I'm hearing is sort of a sensory fidelity, a more holistic idea. Um, uh, and one might, I guess the most common question I get asked about haptics is sort of why it is not more commonplace. Uh, these devices to render forces have some cost. And so I think it's worth throwing out um, this topic of accessibility and, you know, help us understand anyone jump in about, you know, why thing, why haptic technology maybe has less, um, well, how the, how you're addressing the, the, the cost factor in this. Um, you know, I think, you know, in seeing uh, contact CI, for example, I've seen very expensive gloves all the way down to very sort of, uh, you know, cheap solutions like Allison mentioned, just vibration motors in a, in a phone. Um, how are you all addressing um, that piece of, of making things more broadly accessible and lowering cost? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 oh yeah, absolutely. 
Oh no, I'll see you, Danny. I'm happy. I, I just but I actually just had a comment on the previous question about um, you know what type of haptics are appropriate where, and I think one of the things that Craig mentioned earlier, which I think is an excellent point, is you build the haptics for the audience that needs them. And one of the things we find is that, so if I go to a surgeon and say, and I show them a device and they say it needs more haptics for the trainee, they're imparting their value on the learner, which may or may not be true. And so I think designing for that learner is really, really important. So you build the product for that particular audience. And it speaks to Govin's point about the, the decrease in haptics over time. And one of the analogies that I use often is as you become more of an expert at a sport, whether it be golf, volleyball, or even football, you're actually taught to hold the instruments lighter with less grip, with less grip and firmness to actually have more accuracy when you're doing a particular uh, type of sport or whatever. And when you're dissecting through tissue, and I can comment on that, you don't hold the forceps and the, uh, the shears or the medicine bombs tight. You actually hold them with less intensity than you would if you're a, a novice learner. And I'll answer the, the second question, which is the idea of cost. It's the same approach is how do we deliver? So you have to assess what the outcome is, and then you build back from there to see what haptics are required to achieve that skill. And so that's what will basically tell you what's accessible or not. Or if you want to deliver that outcome, could you deliver that same outcome on a broader scale using the least amount of haptics that you require? And that's how we look at it from a cost perspective is what's scalable, not just here, but all over the world. And what's the outcome that we want to establish? And can we achieve that outcome with the minimal amount of haptics? I, I, I would say that's spot on. I, I mean, I, even from my bias standpoint, I agree, right? The part of the, I think Allison, I, I referenced it once, said the, the perfect spectrum of, you know, things have been too low in the force they provide it or too expensive in the, um, in the way that they can be accessible, you know, a lot of the times in terms of the, the haptic side of things. So I think what, you know, as Danny's saying is, specifically designing, you know, if you're going to be adding a haptic to making sure that the cost value of what you're restricting on the user to add another device or to be doing thing is worth the, the data to come back on that side. I, I do have one small thing that I would be interested to hear your thought on Danny though, of what you just said about the gripping lighter. Is that, you know, uh, for example, like, I mean, you said, you know, in the sporting world or in the golf side or, you know, uh, it's from you, you now don't need that sense of touch. But from my understanding, it would be more of that you actually now have a a kind of a higher attuned, you know, sense to what you need to be feeling so that like, if you can, you know, if there is an action that happens from the device, you're more likely to be able to react and know what's going on. So that the, that's where the, I guess the argument from the, what again, I was saying on the kinesthetic or the higher fidelity aspects of, of kind of looking at, you know, if there is something that is a, you know, more attuned later on, maybe that could be beneficial as well. So again, I, I, I think the way of addressing the spectrum is building for the user and not over, over propagating, but I was just curious to thought on, on if, if that could be just being more attuned specifically that, that uh, example. And I'll just jump in. It's okay. We're going to go a little bit over time. Uh, oh, my bad. I didn't realize where we were. Uh, uh, it's okay that we'll hang on for uh, 10.05 before we move over to gather town, but yeah, Danny, what the, well, quickly do you have to <laughs> and this is an excellent discussion so i think it's this transition and as allison mentioned you transition to be more visually oriented and so what i'm finding is when i observe what i'm in surgery what i'm actually paying attention to i'm actually disassociating with what's in my hand and becoming much more visually attuned mm -hmm. so but it's learned over time so i probably started holding those shears or those medicine bombs much more firm and then i graduated graduated quote unquote into a much less sensitivity because I'm more attuned on the visual side. So, but it's an excellent, an excellent question, excellent point. Appreciate the, the expansion. Uh, so I'll throw out a lightning, a lightning round question as we close out and bring your questions to Gather Town to talk to the panel as uh, we could go on for, I could talk all day uh, <laughs> to learn from you all. Um, what are you most excited about uh, for the future of, uh, of haptics in, in the different fields that you're in. Um, what's the top of your, what's your ex most exciting and what's on, on the top of your wish list uh, to fill in the gaps? Yeah, maybe uh, I can go first. So uh, definitely like uh, uh, we, we see in a strong need of like haptics definitely for the learning uh, uh, because uh, 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 we need to train like not only the surgeons like the OR staff or the care team like who are uh, 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 interfacing with our robots and then like uh, if we have to train the, uh, 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 this many people and then like so we need to have a way to train them in a VR and then provide the same sense of like okay like they're, they're interfacing with the, the physical robot and then like so I think if you look at that one 
uh, there is an, uh, a lot of opportunities with this XR and then like definitely like haptics is, is going to play a key role there because these are all the people like who haven't touched and then like so they need to have this uh, sense of like touch and then like okay what it means like if I'm moving the arm to one location to another location. So I think uh, uh, I see that like okay like the the what, what I'm seeing like uh, the 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 work that uh, uh, Craig has done and then like uh, da Danny's uh, uh, precision OS so they have done an amazing job and then like we can see uh, this kind of uh, uh, products uh, it's going to provide a, a good uh, training for the, uh, the the care team. Well, I'm really excited about um, about augmented reality and really understanding what does haptics mean and what should it be in augmented reality where the augmentation is not just visual but haptic right you reach out and physically touch a real object but you want to use haptics to somehow modify how that object feels um, so the integration of a vision and touch the, the need for better tracking systems and haptic devices that are commensurate with still having your hands free to, to you know, interact with real physical objects at the same time as getting this augmented virtual information. Uh, there's just a vast space to be explored and I just feel like we barely touched the surface of that. Absolutely. I, I, I would say for from well, my most excitement right now, it's kind of a little bit of an answer to Joel's last question of part of why haptics can become more accessible right now is there's a huge momentum around lots of developments of technologies, whether it's on the robotic side, whether it's on the tracking side, whether it's on you know, sensors becoming a lot more cost effective, whether it's you know, different motors or you know, uh, Arduino boards and things like that are allowing you know, democratization of you know, building prototypes and people doing things on their DIY scale. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that are attracting you know, the, the uh, knowledge uh, and need for you know, the tactile way of uh, interacting with the computer right now. I think there's a lot of momentum from that as a whole. So that's one of the things I think is most excited is just more people being aware of their desire, I guess, for a haptic experience in the, in the virtual and uh, digital worlds. Yeah, and I'll echo everything that every, everybody said. Uh, in addition to what I'll add is, you know, I'm excited for, you know, patients and physicians moving forward because I think we're moving into a completely different era of learning. Haptics is an important part of that. And it speaks to one of the key elements that's been missing from people who are in sort of the non-accessible parts of the world that can do more than just watching a video or reading a book that can actually have an experience. Then haptics will be the final frontier, I think, that's scalable and accessible to help deliver that across the world. Well said. Wonderful. Thank you very much, That's everybody. That. It was a, was a wonderful discussion. And uh, it's really like this time the Zoom format didn't do it justice because we have we really need now a session where we can try out all these different things. At least Alice, you're just around mm -hmm. the corner, so we don't definitely have to come to the lab at some point. Mm. Um, so now we are moving together to town. I'll put the link into the chat room and uh, into the chat box. And uh, one thing to consider, if you have never been in Gather Town before, please mute yourself in Zoom so that you don't have feedback by having the microphone both in Zoom and Gather Town. You move around to the arrows and you'll, you'll see on this map here, in the, at least in the beginning, in the first few minutes, the candidates will be in the different corners if you have specific questions and then just feel free to mingle. So then see you soon on the other side.